Hi class, today I'm going to go over the topics of momentum and impulse, and this also includes collisions, which is really fun, especially the math part. I know we're not all into math, but in terms of physics, I think collisions is one of the most interesting parts, so we're going to get into that today. So I have a whiteboard here. I'm going to do some math examples on here. Hopefully that works out pretty well. And um, so I welcome you to, as we go through this lecture today, to think about examples that you could make, maybe uh, word problem examples related to these topics. So get your creative juices flowing for this lecture. So here's a pretty typical um, example of momentum and impulse in action. This contraption here in the video is called a Newton's cradle. So it is um, something you might have seen before. So we talked toward the beginning of the class about inertia, and that was the property of an object to maintain its state of motion. And remember, um, like an elephant would be harder to stop than a mouse. So it has more mass, it has more inertia. So related to that is momentum. Momentum is inertia in action. So you can see that the change in motion was more difficult for the truck versus the roller skate in that example. So which would have more inertia? which would maintain its state of motion better. So we like to think of um, mass, large objects having more mass. So which is harder to stop if it's moving, a truck or a roller skate? So usually we think about this happening at the same velocity, at the same speed. Um, but we can kind of describe this relationship with math. Obviously, the first thing you think of is, well, a truck would be harder to stop, of course, um, but it would depend on what speed it's traveling at. So we can describe this relationship with math, and that'll help us visualize this, I think. Will the truck always have more momentum than the skate? So let me put this up here. This will be on your list of formulas you might be keeping. So momentum. Equals mass times velocity. So we already know that mass, increasing the mass would increase the momentum but also increasing the velocity could increase the momentum. So maybe the truck wouldn't always have more momentum than the skate if it's going very slow. For example, what if the truck was stopped? It wouldn't have any momentum. Zero velocity, zero momentum. What if the truck is going very slowly compared to the skate? So a really slow truck and extremely fast skate could technically have the same momentum. So let's calculate this. And this is an example of linear momentum moving in a line. So that's what we're gonna focus on for the beginning of this lecture moving in a straight line. So we're not going to introduce any curves right now. So momentum being mass times velocity. If we're not worried about the direction, then we could say mass times speed. Um, but velocity does matter. We'll get to this later in the lecture. For example, if someone's traveling in the opposite direction of the other thing, we would have to define which direction we're calling the negative velocity. So if I was running west at 10 miles an hour, that's very fast, and someone else was running east 
at 10 miles an hour and we collided, we would have to, in that equation, we would have to designate one of the people to be traveling in a negative direction. So one would be a negative 10 miles an hour. Anyway, I digress. Let's get back to our example here. Um, momentum can also be shown with the Greek letter rho. It looks kind of like a P, but it's not exactly Greek letter rho. So we can also use that. So we can also use a lowercase p if we don't have Greek letters available. So you could have examples with high mass or high velocity, so there'd be high momentum. You could have both high mass and high velocity. Or you could have low masses and low velocity, low momentum. So let's see if there's a circumstance in which a one kilogram roller skate and a thousand kilogram truck would have the same momentum. So we already discussed one situation. What if they were both still? Then there would be zero momentum <coughs> for each of them. Um, another example could be this one right here. And all you have to do is move decimal places around. <coughs> so a thousand kilogram truck moving at 0 0.01 meters per second. So extremely slow crawl has the same momentum as a one kilogram skate moving at 10 meters per second. So both would have a momentum of 10 kilogram meter second. So how do we get that weird unit? Mass would be kilograms, right? Velocity is meters per second. So we have to keep an eye on our units throughout this lecture today. So here's our example. Let me try to move myself around. Oh, I can't. Okay, here's our examples at the top. Perfect. So one example that came to mind when I was reading about this topic is a super tanker. So this is the largest vehicles on earth. Huge amounts of mass involved. And the momentum then is enormous. So these super tankers are out in the ocean. They, these examples are showing super tankers carrying liquids, maybe like gasoline is a big one, diesel. Um, there's others that are huge ships that are carrying cargo so they're stacked with train cars. And this is how we get our materials from China, for example. They're shipped overseas on these huge, huge ships. So the momentum of these vehicles is enormous, even if they're traveling at a slow speed. So it's very hard to stop. So these vehicles actually have to put the brakes on several miles from shore before they even see the shore they have to start slowing down or they're going to end up crashing into the shoreline. So I think it's impressive that they're even able to dock such large vehicles. Um, look at this example showing the size of these. So along the bottom here is, is the one of the longest um, super tankers. Let me get my highlighter here, right here. So look at this, half a kilometer long. So much longer than the biggest building, the Empire State Building. So pretty impressive. So here's an example of one changing its velocity because it's turning in this example. So to be able to turn, it would have to change its velocity, change its direction. So that would, um, they would have to really think that turn through in advance. So here's some examples to think about. I'm gonna go get my eraser for my whiteboard while you think about this. Think of something with a low mass, but high momentum. What would you need in that example? You would need a low mass, something small or lightweight, but high momentum would be high speed, high velocity. So think about that. I'm gonna go get my 
whiteboard eraser. All right, did you think of something? So one that I think about that is amazing, kind of sad sometimes, but um, if anyone goes hunting and they use a gun, let's pretend it's gun season for deer. So you have a few days to use your shotgun for deer. So that slug that you have, that large, it's not quite a bullet, but similar, um, a bullet would be something with a low mass. It's not very heavy. It doesn't have a lot of mass, but very high speed. So it would have high momentum. So that's a pretty good example. Another example is one time I was driving in my convertible and I got hit in the face by an acorn. And my relative speed to that acorn was pretty high because I was driving at the time. And uh, the acorn was not a lot of um, mass, but it actually did hurt my head pretty bad. So there's another example. Uh, what about thinking about cars in a parking lot? What's their momentum? Would a car or a truck have more momentum in a parking lot? So this is where it's easy to get a little confused because of what we talked about initially with inertia, but we need a velocity in order to have a momentum. So if a car is stationary, it has no momentum. But what about inertia? The inertia of the cars in the parking lot. If they have more mass, they have more inertia. They have um, the property of staying at rest, staying in their state of motion. So they do have inertia. And in that case, something with higher mass would have higher inertia. So a truck would have higher inertia than a car, probably. So this is where it gets really cool and we start to relate concepts together. So impulse is something that is probably obvious once you see these examples, but it's the product of force and contact time. So if you're doing a force, pushing something for a longer time, there's more impulse. It's not that there's more force because you could be applying the same force over that time period, but more impulse. So we all know that if you're at the grocery store and you tap your shopping cart, it might go a little bit of distance, but if you push on it for a while and let go, it'll have more, more momentum. So impulse has to do with the force and the time in which the, the force is applied. So greater force for a long time would be a large impulse. The same force, but a short time, so just tapping the shopping cart would be a small impulse. So here's an example that I came up with regarding this uh, man and his son, a little kid on a bicycle. So let me show you the math for this. So impulse, I'll write this on here sideways here. Let's see if I can do this. The force times time. So in this case, a reasonable amount of force that a man might be applying to push his kid on the bicycle could be 50 newtons times time. Let's say that he pushed the child for three seconds. So the impulse would be 150 newton seconds. All right. Great, we're gonna expand on this example in a minute. So, this is where things get really interesting. There's actually an impulse momentum relationship where the change in momentum is equal to the force applied multiplied by the contact time. So that means impulse equals the change in momentum. Remember, change is shown by a delta triangle. Change in momentum, but what was momentum? 
mass times velocity. Momentum's mass times velocity. I'll just put momentum here. Momentum. Okay, I can't fit it in. Momentum. So, impulse equals a change in momentum. So let's look at some examples of this. So that means impulse, which is force times time applied, equals change in momentum, change in mass, velocity. So that is really useful. So if you apply a greater force, you'll end up with a greater change in velocity. So let's assume in that example that the mass stays the same. Same force over a short amount of time would be less change in velocity, less change in momentum. Same force for a longer amount of time, more change in momentum, or probably change in velocity. So let's look back at the example with the kid on a bicycle. So we had the force and the time here. So let's write this all out. I'm going to erase some of this stuff. What if we wanted to determine how fast the child would end up traveling? So in this example, we have the impulse equation. I'm just going to put it up here. Force times time equals the change in momentum right there. And then we're going to put in some fake numbers that make sense for this. So 50 newtons of force, we know that's not very much force. That's a reasonable amount for a father. So let's say that he applied that force over the course of three seconds. Would the child's mass change? No. <laughs> no, let's just say no. So let's say the child is 25 kilograms, since a kilogram is about two pounds, times the velocity, so times the change in velocity. So we want to look at the change in velocity. Let's assume the child was stationary at the beginning. So we're going to go from zero to some number. So that's what we're going to try to figure out. How fast was a child traveling at the end of this experiment? So we could divide each side by 25 kilograms. Oops, 25, I'll put it like this, 25 kilograms. All right, so we can cancel those out. We're left with what we want, change in velocity. But this gets weird. How do these units work out? Three seconds, kilograms, newtons. What? Okay, let's review what a newton is. That'll help us out a lot. Let me erase some stuff here. Make some space. Does anybody remember what a Newton is equivalent to? All right, one Newton. I'm just gonna draw it in a box up here. A Newton equals one kilogram. Because remember, Matt, um, Newton is a unit of force. What's the equation for force? Mass times acceleration. So kilogram, that's mass. Acceleration, meters per second squared is the unit. So a Newton has kilogram meter second squared. That's what it is. So if we write this out like that, instead of putting Newtons here as the amount of force applied, we're going to do this. So you've got 50 
instead of putting newtons, I'm going to put kilogram meters per second squared. Perfect. So we can now cross out kilograms. That cancels out. Great. So now what do we have? This equals 50. Well, 50 times 3, we can do that. So 150. Guess I'll draw this like that. 150 meters per second squared. And this is another second, right? So the second's up here. Divided by 25. We already canceled the unit right there. So can we do, deal with this? We have a second on the top and two on the bottom. So we can get rid of this one and we can get rid of this two. Now it's just one second down there. So 150 divided by 25. Takers, six meters per second. Is meters per second a unit of velocity? That's what we want. It is. So the kid's traveling six meters per second. Pretty fast for a kid on a bike. Wonderful. Perfect. So. If we want to increase the momentum, we want to apply a great amount of force over a long distance or a long time period as long as we can. So this is why uh, there's some examples here. This is why you'd want to pull a slingshot or an arrow back for as long as you could, a long time, or have a cannon with a longer cannon so that the force can be applied through the whole cannon. Um, if I'm a golfer, so I put this image up of a golfer following through very nicely on her swing. So a golfer, you don't wanna just pull back and then hit the ball and stop. If you can, you wanna keep contact with the ball for longer. So that's why they say you should actually follow through like that so that your club head and the ball can interact for a longer amount of time before the ball is flung off of the club head. So you want to have a great force, but also a great force for as long as possible. So this brings us to another type of example of decreasing momentum. So let's see about this. I'm going to erase the board here. Think about which of these examples, these are cars of the same mass. You can see the color is different, but the car has the same mass. Um, which of these would have a different change in momentum if it came to a stop from the same speed? So the change in momentum would be the same, right? Change in momentum would be like that. So if it goes from stopped from some speed, let's say 20 miles an hour to zero miles an hour, if it becomes stopped, then we have the same change in velocity, we could agree. So the change in momentum in these two examples is the same, even though one of them is hitting a wall. That's what's being shown um, down here. And one of them is hitting a bale of hay. So the same change in momentum. But which one would you rather hit? Probably the bale of hay. So we can explain why with physics. So in this example, it shows it here that hitting the bale of hay, you would come to a stop slower. So over a larger amount of time, that's what's being shown with this big T here, whereas hitting a wall, you would come to a sudden stop, so the time would be smaller. So that means that the force of impact would change. So look at this. If the change in momentum, which you've already determined is the same for both cars, is the same as force times time. So if you have a greater time over which it stops, then the force would have to be lower. 
you had a larger, if you had a smaller amount of time, like very quick, then the impact force would have to be larger. So that's the concept here. We can call this impact force or stopping force. Those are both ways to explain this. So the momentum is decreased by the same amount, force times time, but hitting the haystack would extend the time of impact, the time in which the momentum is brought to zero or the velocity is brought to zero. So that reduces the force of impact. So if you want to decrease the force of impact, you want to extend the time of the impact. So this is examples of stopping force or force of impact. So if you are able to change the time of impact from 0 0.01 seconds, so pretty much instantaneously, to one second, then you would be reducing the force of impact by 100 times. So lots of safety features and safety equipment, they are using this concept. So airbags, for example, that would make the time of impact for the person a lot longer. Safety nets would slow you, but wouldn't bring you to a sudden stop. Um, catching a ball, you kind of ride with it to catch it. You don't hold it up like this. Um, bungee jumping cords, moving with a punch, as a boxer would do. Flexing your knees when you jump, instead of jumping flat-footed and using a wrestling mat would actually allow someone to hit more gradually than just being on the floor. And this is talking about dropping a glass on the carpet instead of on the sidewalk. So in this case, a boxer is able to increase the impact time by five times by riding with the punch. So how much would the force of impact be reduced. So we could use this here. We're just using this side here. So if he's able to use a fifth of the time, then if he's able to break the time up or extend it by five, then he's going to decrease the force by five times. So that's a lot. Only a fifth of the force? That's a lot better, right? be reduced by five times. So that's really helpful. So the examples we've been talking about are talking about within a closed system. And that's not really realistic. But when we are doing these types of problems, we want to define what our system is, because we're talking about the momentum being conserved um, within that system itself. So this is talking about the law of conservation of momentum, and that's what we're thinking about when we have to enclose the system and talk about what our system is. So the example before we had a man and his son, we didn't really deal with it the way we should have because we should have included the man in the system, but we'll do that in a few minutes. We'll include some examples of that. Um, in the absence of an external force, the momentum of the system remains unchanged. So we have the same momentum before as after, so we're going to use some examples in a few minutes that use multiple masses. So in this case here, this, these dashed lines are showing the system. So in this case, we have a ball coming in from this side, hitting the eight ball. And if we only talk about the system of the eight ball, then the momentum is increasing, the momentum of this system, because it got hit. Now it's moving quickly. Um, if we had an eight ball flying at a cue ball and we defined this direction as being negative velocity, then the momentum would be decreasing. But if we wanted to include both balls in the system, then the momentum would be conserved. The, the speed would just transfer from one ball to another. 
So momentum could be con conserved in that case. So what does this sort of remind you of from Newton's laws? In the absence of an external force, the momentum of the system remains unchanged. This is really similar to Newton's first law. He said that objects continue in a state of rest or uniform speed unless acted on by a force, that they maintain their state of equilibrium unless they're acted on by a force. So we can also use one of Newton's laws, Newton's third law, talking about how forces are opposite but equal because the net force of the system is conserved. So does that mean that the, in this case, Newton's third law states that the forces exerted on a cannon and a cannonball are equal and opposite. So that's why the cannon would flinch back a little bit when the cannonball shoots out. Does it mean that the impulse exerted on the cannon and the cannonball are also equal and opposite? So let's look at impulse again. Impulse equals force times time. Since the forces would be equal and opposite, time doesn't have a direction, then yes. The impulse on these objects would be equal and opposite. So here we can get into collisions. That was kind of an example of a collision right there. So there's a few different types um, that we're going to do examples of. Elastic collisions. Here comes a ball hitting another ball. So the momentum, the change in momentum, is transferred from one object to another. So these are both examples of elastic collisions. So even though the momentum is conserved of the system of the two balls, there is a transfer from one object to another. An inelastic collision is when something sticks together. So here's two train cars traveling and they get stuck together. So that's an example of inelastic. So would Newton's cradle be an example of elastic or inelastic collisions? Is the momentum completely transferred from one object to another? I would say it is, so it's an elastic collision. So the total momentum before and after would be the same for the system that you're talking about. So we can define any different systems. So here's a good example. What if there was a fish swimming and swallows another fish How? that was at rest? Find the velocity of the first fish immediately after lunch. So let's try it. We said conservation of momentum means the momentum before is the same as the momentum after. So, big fish eats a small fish. Six kilograms, two kilograms, one meter per second, and this one was at rest. So the momentum of the system before, we would use the momentum equation. So mass times velocity. So what would the mass times velocity of this fish be? Six kilograms times one meters per second. 
plus, this is before, mass times the velocity before, plus the mass, 2 kilograms, times the velocity. Ooh, we're multiplying by 0. So this is 0. His initial momentum was 0 because he was at rest. So we don't really need the first fish anymore. We're going to erase that. So we've got mass times velocity before equals mass times velocity after. So here we've got, he ate him, right? So what was the total mass after? It would be 6 kilograms plus 2 kilograms because he ate him times the velocity after. What's velocity after? Oh, that's what we're trying to find out. So here we are. So now we have our six kilogram meters per second. That's the before equals eight kilograms V after. So we divide each side by eight kilograms. Kilograms would cancel. Uh, cancel. So velocity after would be eight or six divided by eight, or we could simplify that three fourths, and the unit here meter per second. So that's what we want. All right. I also have it typed out in the slide, but that's a little easier for you to see. Perfect. So there we go. So we could convert this three quarter meters to 75 centimeters if we want. How? Sorry, my fish got eaten behind my head. Okay, here's another example. I'm going to leave this up to you to solve, but the solution will also be in the slides. So I suggest you try this out by pausing the video right here. And here's the solution. I'm sure you already did this. So since the other fish in this example, the fish that gets eaten, was moving towards, that slowed the velocity of the first fish down more. So he was traveling at one meters per second, now he's traveling at only a quarter meter per second. So there's actually two types of momentum. We've been talking about linear momentum. So in a line, there's also angular momentum. This is resulting from the rotation or spin of an object. So linear is what we've been talking about so far. So angular momentum is also conserved in the system, and uh, it actually involves the radius. So it has to do with the radius, how wide the circle of spinning is. So angular momentum is mass times velocity times the radius. So the radius could also be measured in centimeters, right? So what if you increased the radius of a closed system? So it was small and now it's big. Then you'd have to decrease something else. Mass wouldn't decrease in a closed system. So you'd have to decrease the velocity. Similarly, if you made the radius smaller, it would increase the velocity of a closed system because a closed system says mass, velocity, radius before equals mass, velocity, radius after. So if you decrease this r, you'd have to increase v to make up for that. 
So this is the best example. Has anybody ever watched figure skating, particularly on the Olympics? I always watch it during the Winter Olympics. So you see the figure skater go into a jump like, and then they are spinning with their arms outstretched as they jump into it. And then they put their arms together and they start spinning so fast you can't even see them, they're a blur. That's how this works. The force of friction is low because of the ice. So that's why it works so well for ice skaters. But they're able to increase their rotational speed by making their radius smaller. So here, the radius would be large. It would be from the center of the head out to your arm. You can't even see my hand. But here, the radius is only this. So they make it smaller so they're able to rotate at a faster speed. So we talked about vectors. So remember, velocity has a vector. So if momentum is mass times velocity, then that also must have a vector or a direction. So we can use um, vectors in a kind of cool way. We could, for example, in a collision, predict which direction in a car crash the cars would end up going. And that's because we know the momentum of their initial movement. So here's initial movement of car A and car B. We could calculate which direction they would end up going after the impact. Um, it seems kind of weird, but you can also split up masses. What if you had a bomb, a large bomb, and it blew up? So now the mass is separated into all these little pieces. So the sum of all of the momentum of each piece is equal to the initial of the bomb. So the bomb was at rest in this example, and then it blew up. So the initial was mass times velocity, velocity was zero. So initially it had zero. But if you took all these vectors and you added them up and you defined one direction as negative and one as positive, then um, all the vectors would also add to zero.